We're in the middle of session two, and that's where we'll pick up. And session two is focusing on the inroads or the beginnings of starting to rebuild that positive relationship or rebuild the relationship between the parent and the child. So attending, as we just defined, is really showing interest in or paying attention to what the child's doing. And we touched on some of this, but I wanted to make sure we were, I was being clear that some of the consequences of overly controlling or reprimanding um, interactions with the child is that over time the parent can become exhausted. Again, I think most of us know this, but sometimes bringing that to light for the parent as an explanation for, yeah, this is really hard, it is really exhausting to feel like you're struggling to maintain this level of control all the time can be a validating experience for parents. Um, it also can have the ancillary consequence of not giving kids the space or the freedom to start to assert their independence or their creativity or to start to develop some internal control mechanisms. So internal control mechanisms being when do I inhibit my impulse versus when do I not inhibit my impulse or when do I make the choice to do this behavior versus not. If parents are too controlling of the situation, it sometimes takes that learning opportunity away from the child. And even though not inhibiting negative behaviors can be difficult to deal with. It is an important learning experience for kids to learn when a situation, when a behavior is appropriate in a situation and when it's not. And then thirdly, as I think we've commented, it creates a negative parent-child tone or creates a negative tone in a relationship. Um, attending, just generally showing interest in what the child's doing, however, can result in making the child feel good about being with the parent creates a situation in which the child wants the positive attention again and starts to rebuild that relationship. So for all these reasons, it's why we tend to present it early in behavioral parent training programs because that's often a relationship that has deteriorated and we want to teach parents how to redevelop it. Other things that are important is that positive attending or paying attention to what the kids are doing can help to, just the very act of doing that can help to promote positive behavior. So just doing a behavior, regardless of intention or strategic praise, you do a behavior, it's followed by attention. You do a behavior, it's followed by attention. You do a behavior, it's followed by attention. For many kids, attention is something that's going to cause a behavior to be reinforced or to increase. So just the very act of showing interest in what kids are doing can have the benefit of increasing the positive behaviors that kids are doing. Um, it helps the parent to communicate the interest that they may have in what their child's doing and also in terms start to develop the child's self-esteem because the parent is showing interest in it. And finally, I think the, the greatest benefit is that it helps the parent to start to feel closer to their child again. So I want to talk about the mechanics of what attending looks like so that way we can help to guide our parents in how to attend to their kids. So an example of attending during play might be, oh, you're connecting the blue level lever to the yellow hinge, it fits. Now you're fastening the other level lever. The levers are going up and down. They're going up and down. It, it's really just uh, neutrally describing the situation that's happening, showing interest in what's happening just by describing to the child what it is they're doing. Another example might be getting down on the floor right beside the child but not playing with him. Just watching attentively, showing him your eyes or showing her you're your paying attention to the activity while doing verbal positive attending. I want to be clear that for attending and positive attending, when I say that, I don't qualitatively mean that it has to be artificially positive. I mean you're adding attention to the situation with the intention of reinforcing the behavior. So your attention is being added, hence it's positive attending. Um, if Johnny asks you to play with him, you can gently tell him no, but assure him you're not going to leave, that you're just there to be with him, to spend time with him. Okay? So positive attending really in, is involved in teaching parents just to be present, to be an active participant or an active viewer, observer of what's happening. And they can do that by describing what's happening, being present, showing nonverbal attending. And really, in some ways, it's a very subtle behavior, but often one that parents stop doing and over time can erode the behavior. One thing that we do want to tell parents is that 
If they're paying attention to the activity and the child starts to misbehave, if it's minor, they can stop attending and then resume attending as soon as the behavior starts to become appropriate again. If it's more major misbehavior, it might be time for the parent to just get up and remove themselves from the situation, but come back once the behavior resolves. So what we want to emphasize to parents, again, this sometimes can feel a bit disconcerting to parents because it is such a subtle, it's not a you know, go in, guns blazing, star chart type of, type of skill, but it's really teaching parents to start to rebuild that relationship. And they're just providing interest or attention to the activities that their kids are doing by describing it, by labeling it, by being actively present, by observing it, and then removing themselves from that situation if misbehavior starts to happen. So before we get into the mechanics of it, just providing attention to a behavior or following a behavior, providing attention to the situation for most children typically is a reinforcer or is going to increase that behavior. So the message we want to send to parents is we want to start to rebuild that relationship. We want your child to start to kind of reintegrate that relationship with you. The ancillary benefit is we want to start to make the behaviors happening during the time you spend with them more positive. And one way of doing that is to make your attention meaningful again and to start to make the time you spend with your child meaningful again. So being present while they're doing an activity, if misbehavior starts happening, to stop attending or to remove themselves from the situation and then reintegrate themselves as soon as the behavior goes back to being a positive behavior again. Again, I know it sounds very subtle, but that's gonna be the first skill that we ask parents to work on. And part of how we're going to work on that is to have them do it frequently, have them do it daily until they come back to you for another session. So typically to do it five to seven times per week for around 15 minutes a time. And again, that doesn't sound like a huge amount of time, but compared to what some parents might be doing or the quality of the interaction that they've been happening, that can be a dramatic change in the type of interaction that they're having with their child. So, what we're going to do is work through the role plays that we would be doing in session with our parents. So again, we're gonna role play because one thing I want to make sure that we're clear on as therapists is what attending is and what attending is not. So we're gonna practice this first with a child who is not showing any disruptive behavior. When you're going through this in session, you'll have to use some clinical judgment about how quickly to <clears throat> integrate bringing a child into session. So if it's something that a parent masters or seems to master very readily, it might be time to bring the child and have the parent practice in session with the child. Alternatively, you may want to practice with the parent several times, you taking the role of parent and then the role as child and then them the role as child and you, you know, them <laughs> there having the role as parent and you have the role of child to make sure that the attention that they're giving to their kids isn't negative attention. They don't start to be overly controlling. They're not reprimanding. Um, that they understand that it's not kind of, oh, I really like that you're playing with blocks right now and that you're listening to mommy, but it's really more of a, um, you know, oh, you're playing with blocks right now. You're stacking that blue block on top of the yellow block. Now you're stacking a yellow block on top of a blue block. Or, you know, I'm sitting here watching you play. I like being near you when you're playing and just watching the child. So just really kind of the basic modeling of paying attention in a neutral way to the positive behaviors that the child's doing. Does that make sense what the intent is? So again, to make sure that we're clear as therapists, we're going to practice it here in session. Um, for the first role play, as written up there, we're gonna have a non-disruptive child. Then we'll do it with a disruptive child. Again, so you're clear the message and the skill that you're working on teaching parents, okay? So let's do dyads again, or groups of three. So may I ask the two of you to be partners again? Would the two of you like to be partners again? Sure. The three of you care to be? Okay. Are you guys be partners again? Okay. And the three of you can work together? Okay. All set? All set? So three of you, the two of you. We all set? Okay. Before we get going, before we're off to the races, let's hold off for a second. Who's gonna be the child first in the, rela in the relationship, in the dyad? 
Before we move on, thank you. Before we move on, by a show of hands, can you please raise your hand if you're the child and leave your hand up for a moment? So you're the child, leave your hand up for a second. Leave your hand up, thank you, leave your hand up. Who's gonna be the child? Leave your hand up for me. Who's gonna be the child back here? Leave your hand up for me. Who's gonna be the child in your group? I'll come back to you in just a moment. Who's gonna be the child here? You will? Who's gonna be the child? Okay. Who's gonna be the child back there? Ladies, who's gonna be the child? Are you gonna be the child? Okay. Who's gonna be the child? Who's gonna be the child? And then who's gonna be the child? Okay, children, I want you to share with your parent how old you are, your gender, your name, um, and what activity you're doing so that the parent knows when they're attending to the situation what it is that they're attending to. Uh, parents, if you want to share with your child um, any activity that you hope for them to do or an age or whatnot, that's fine to do. What I want you whomever the parents are, I want you to pay special attention to just observing what's happening. So children, please actually do something, whether it's drawing, coloring, give people something the opportunity to attend to. This is gonna be a relatively quick role play and then we'll come back together. All right, we're not gonna go back into partners right away. I actually just wanna hear from the group. So those of you who are, were the children and were doing a behavior, your parent, parent, was attending to that behavior. So describing what you were doing, labeling what you were doing, showing you eye contact, generally trying to show you interest and not, honestly, not in an overly positive way, but a neutral to positive way. So again, I know that it's difficult when we're adults pretending to be kids, but I would like to hear from kids your reaction of how that felt to have an adult interact with you like that. Um, I'm 15 years old, so it was a little odd. Odd, sure. And so we came up with the fact that maybe him not making a comment because I was doing my homework mm -hmm. and I was, I did have a phone or whatever, him not making a comment about the texting or anything, but just being in the same room. Okay. Not necessarily right there because there's a certain sure. privacy thing. Sure. Absolutely. Just being in the same room while I'm doing my work mm -hmm. would be probably very effective for a teenager. Okay. So one developmental consideration for a teenager, and I absolutely agree, agree with you, um, attending is more relevant for younger kids, and we do have to make developmental considerations as kids get older. And in your manual, there are developmental considerations. But certainly for an older child, it would be like, oh, you're doing your math problem now. <laughs> now you're texting. <laughs> and it would feel very socially odd. But so making the adaptation of just being present or perhaps choosing an activity that the child likes to do, whether it's a board game or even a video game, something that the parent can simply interact with the child doing, being mindful that criticism or harsh reactions or directions isn't what to do. Let's come back together again as a larger group for a second. Who is someone that role played a younger child? Okay, so how did it feel getting that kind of feedback or that kind of attention from a parent? It was almost funny, it's almost like it was a, like a therapy, even though she was the parent, mm -hmm. the child was almost like, I guess what I would imagine is since I have this color, like drawing, mm -hmm. like maybe art therapy or play therapy would be there because mm -hmm. she was very attentive and I drew, but then I showed, it's almost like I, since she was there, I was mm -hmm. showing her what I was drawing. Look, I'm drawing a picture of me. Uh -huh. Look, I'm drawing a picture of Marge, and then she repeated it back to me. So mm -hmm. I knew she was attentive to what I was doing. Okay. So, so she, in some ways, did a lot of imitation, not so much describing what you're doing, but you'd show her, and then she would repeat it back to you. Okay. And what about here? How is that? How did that explain? My mommy let me be me. Okay. <laughs> and the um, level of skill was not too good, but mm -hmm. she never criticized it, as my teacher did. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> she was very, uh, I thought, very neutrally involved, but I felt her presence very much. Okay, so it's sounding like what I'm hearing from kids is that having the presence of the parent felt welcoming. Even during a role play in which we're two adults interacting with each other, it didn't come off as aversive, it came off as welcoming. So let me ask you, the very first time that parents do this with their child, what do you think the reaction might be? Might, might be a little shock, a little awkward, yep. Might be out of character. And I think that's a fair expectation to have, and it might be one to bring up to parents and to say, the first time you do this with your child, how might they react to you? 
again, also taking into account that this level of, oh, you're coloring, you're stacking one block on top of the other, might be more developmentally appropriate for a younger child, and the type of attending may need to evolve as the child gets older. So the, the child might say, you're being weird, or this is weird, or, or feel like it's an awkward situation, and the parent might feel that it's awkward. Okay, so let's say now the parent does it, they have the expectation it might be weird or awkward or, or not feel comfortable to them. Let's say they do it two more days in a row. What impact might that start to have on the child? Might start to become part of their routine. What else might it impact? It might start to help their self-esteem. Do you think they might like the time with the parent? Yes. Okay. Do you think there might still be some reticence on the part of the parent and the child? Okay, so let's say now it's been happening for five to seven days. So the parent's done it every day for 15 minutes. What expectation of change or what expectation might we have in a week's period of time? What message do you think the parent's sending to their child? The, so if you've done it every day, you're sending the message that I like to spend time with you. You're important to me. What else might message might it send? I'm taking my part of my own. Okay, so I'm taking part of my time because you're important to me and I want to spend that with you. Mom just doesn't come over when you're in trouble for something. Mom doesn't just come over when you're in trouble for something. Mom wants to spend time with you. I enjoy watching you. I value what you're doing and how you do it. I value what you're doing. I enjoy watching you. So what we did here as therapists for some parents might be a useful strategy of normalizing that, particularly if this is very different from something that they've done before, to expect that it's going to feel a bit odd or that their kids might even react with, why are you sitting here? What are you doing? Why are you? Did you lose your job? Very funny, very nice. <laughs> so, but it might feel genuinely so disconcerting because it's so different from what's been happening. But to talk through with the parents, what message, if you do this two days in a row, do you think is going to be the reaction of your child, or what message might you be sending them? If you do this four or five days in a row, what message are you sending to your child? If you do this a week in a row, what message are you sending to your child? And for any, any expectations that they have that might be unrealistic, to helping to qualify those with what our expectations are, and to also support them that, yeah, sometimes it's really tough finding 15 minutes in a day to do it. What's the value of it? What's the long-term hope that you're, you're going for? Yes? The child rejects the parent. OK, so that's a good question. What if the child rejects the parent? So leave me alone. Go away. What do you think are some different responses from the parent? You don't want me to sit so close. OK, so you don't want me to sit so close? So the parent might feel like the child's mad at them or upset with them. Yep. Again, I think you're bringing up a good point of what could happen. The child's like, no, I don't want to play with you or I don't want to have you involved with me. And I think you know, another thing that we're, we're kind of going through the manual at, at warp speed. Um, but one thing that's important is setting parents up for how to set up this, this new behavior with their kids. So introducing this concept of, you know, I want to start spending some time with you and just you every day. I want to start you know, having some hangout time with you. Or we're going to start something new. I'm going to spend some time with you every day. I may not be playing with you, but I'm going to stay here for our whole 15 minutes. Or I'm going to set a timer, and I'm not going to go um, for these 15 minutes to start to set the stage that this is something new and different that's going to be happening. And even if the child says, I don't want you to play with me, giving parents a list of alternatives of what they can do. So would you come back another time? Would you just stay anyway but not engage with the child? What's going to be your, your form of recourse if something happens? So our first role play that we do with parents is really just getting them to practice doing the skill of being present, of attending, of paying attention to the activity with the child. Again, not artificially positive, but just um, mimicking, imitating, paying attention to, describing what the child's doing. What we want to make sure that we emphasize to the parent are some don'ts, so things we don't want them to do. We don't want them to teach their kids how to properly play the game. If the child's playing and they're playing incorrectly, that's okay. This is the time they're just being invested in what their child's doing. The outcome is not what's important here. It's more the process of being with them that's important. 
the parents don't want to ask them questions. A lot of parents rely on asking questions to elicit response from their kids. And that's not intrinsically wrong. But if that's their main repertoire of, of getting anything from their kids over time, it can start to feel like instruction or start to feel like directives or, oh, you're playing with a cat. What letter does cat start with? It takes away from the value of just spending time or showing interest in the child. They're not going to use commands. They're not going to introduce talking that's unrelated to the child's play. Oh, let me tell you about my day today. It's just really them being present and spending time showing interest in what their child's doing. And then finally, not criticizing or punishing their child. So as you're going through their role plays, what you're going to be looking for is, can they reflect upon what their child is doing? Can they show interest? Can they observe? Can they describe? If they are starting to do a lot of these don't skills, I would suggest practicing with the, your parent. And you can share with them these don't skills, but practicing with them until they feel comfortable with you how to t attend to an activity with their child not resulting to criticism or to questions or to changing the subject or trying to give instructives. So practicing with them till you feel like they've reached a sense of mastery. Then we may want to graduate the difficulty. So we just did a role play with a child who wasn't being disruptive at all, who was letting us attend to their activity. So particularly for parents who have a child with some disruptive behavior, there may be value in having them practice that graduated difficulty level because going and playing with their child may not be as easy as it is doing it with you in session. So we'll go through a role play of what to do if the child starts to be disruptive. Yes? What do you do uh, if the parent you're working with, there's three or four children in the home? Mm -hmm. Do you have it do, then do it with all the children? And if not, if they're doing it with just one child, how are the other children going to feel like that? That's a good question. For this first week, they are going to do it, if they're coming in for one specific child for whom their relationship has just kind of unraveled, they're going to be having special time or attending time with that child. Siblings aren't allowed to be involved. It's that time for the parent to rebuild with the child. Now, if there are multiple children and the parent wants to do it with multiple kids, they can have respective alone times. Or if there's a co-parenting situation, you could have one parent take one child while the other takes another child or a group of kids and trade off. It is a commitment of time. There's no denying that. Um, and so I would work with parents who are foreseeing some barriers to plan ahead for how to get around those barriers. But yes, for at least this first week, um, what I want you to do is have them commit to spending quality time, special time, hangout time, whatever it is that they call it, with their child one-on-one. -on -one. They don't have to do it at the expense of the others. They can have QT with the others as well. But they want to make sure they have it with that particular child. Does that answer your question? OK. So we're going to be moving on to a more graduated difficulty level. Again, if parents are mastering these attending skills relatively quickly, and you can see that in session, you may want to bring the child in for practice or plan for the next time for them to practice with the child. Um, again, if you have a parent who's really struggling with this, this might be something that you want to present over a couple of sessions to make sure that it's something they're going to be successful with. And I'll leave that decision to you and to your clinical judgment. But really what the intent here is for parents to start to practice more engagement with their kids. If kids are misbehaving during special time or quality time, which some kids will do because it's, this is still new and still different, what we want you to teach parents to do is that if the child starts becoming destructive or aggressive, we want the parent to react to it and deal with it as they typically would. So if they would typically put their child into timeout, still do timeout. If they would typically um, make their child do a chore or go sit in the corner, whatever their, their typical repertoire is, to do that, stop special time and to come back to it later when the child's no longer being destructive or aggressive. If, however, you are concerned that the parent might resort to overly punitive or physical strategies, that's what their norm is, then what I would do is come up with a contingency plan or maybe as we work through some of our other strategies for punishment, introduce that earlier so that we can then move into quality time more productively. So again, that's a decision that I will charge you with and leave you with. If it's minor misbehavior, I want you to instruct the parent to either kind of disengage from them, they can stay present, but disengage. The intent is 
not to give attention to that misbehavior or to even get up and leave the situation and say, you know, right now you're not being very respectful of me, so quality time's gonna be over, play time's gonna be over, I'll come back when, when we can play again and keep trying to come back to the situation. Again, the intent of this is not to be anything more than strictly giving attention to the child, showing interest in what the child's doing during playtime, during the child's time, and to start to rebuild that relationship. So we don't want to put parents in situations where things unravel so quickly that they feel like, here I failed at quality time again, but to set them up that if things start to unravel, if behaviors go right, it's okay to stop it and come back to it later. And if the behaviors are minor, to stop engaging with the child, and then no need to reprimand, not criticize, not try to correct their behavior, not try to instruct them or tell them what to do, but to just stop, and then re-engage when the behavior stops, okay? So we're gonna role play that here now, again, to make sure that we appropriately understand how to do that so we can help to guide parents in how to do it. So I'm gonna have you in dyads again and partners again. Whomever was the child last time will have you be the child this time. Your level of disruptive behavior is not going to be too disruptive. You're not gonna be aggressive, no throwing chairs. This is not the time to, to act out all the things you've seen kids do, but to show some mildly disruptive behaviors. Parents, your job during this role play is to disengage. So how might you disengage from the child? Looking away, not speaking any longer, maybe slightly turning your body away from the child, anything to stop engagement. And these are the types of things that you're gonna be looking for for your parents to do. Yes? What if the child kind of like throws a tantrum because the parents stopped attending? Like right then and there, mommy, look at me, and like throws mm -hmm. a fit and whines and cries and whatever. At yep. that moment when you're trying to do this strategic yeah. mm -hmm. thing, but at that moment he does something completely off. Okay. That's a great question because that's something that might happen to parents and the more we can prep them for some different outcomes. So let's say a parent just asked us that. And as therapists we have in our mind, our intention with this skill is to start rebuilding the relationship between the parent and the child, to start making the parent's attention valuable to the child, and to start simply having a behavior and, and a reinforcement, behavior and reinforcement. What advice might you give the parent? So the child, so child does a minor misbehavior, the parent looks away or stops responding or maybe slightly turns their body, and the child unravels, starts to have a, to have a temper tantrum. What might be some different ways to advise the parent? Yes? So it seems to me if they're not presenting a danger, walking away might be a good thing. Yeah, so that might be the time to not talk to them, but just walk away. And when things have calmed down, to come back and say, I'm ready to play again. I'm ready, I'm ready for a special time again. What else might we advise parents? We might actually. Uh, ask them if they would like to explain that to the child. When you're ready to play again, we'll do that. Okay, so having the parent practice a very simple statement. So not talking with the child for long periods of time, but saying, you know, when you're calm back down, I'll come back to play. Or when you're calm, I'll come back to play. What else could we advise parents? Remain calm. Remain calm. I'll try to do best, you know, yep. And this might be another opportunity for why it's important for us to practice this in session so we can see what parents might do when we're role playing disruptive behavior. Or if we have their child in, we can see what they do because some parents think that they're ignoring their kids, but they're like, you know, or giving lots of attention to them or trying to manage the behavior. And so that's when we'll want to coach parents into, you know, as you're looking at him or as you're trying to pick him up, it's still attention that you're giving to him. Let's try turning your body away. I'm, you know, I'm right here with you. We'll, we'll practice this together. Or you handled that really well. You, you turned your eye contact away from him until he stopped, and then you came right back and started attending again. So again, these are considerations, and there's, you know, it, it, it's hard sometimes. You want to give the perfect right answer, or the, the perfect answer to kids, and I want to give the perfect answer to you of how to handle it. The main intent is you want to reinforce the pro-social behavior, rebuild the relationship. You don't want to reinforce negative behavior, so you want parents to really practice paying attention and not paying attention, and to ultimately lengthen the time that they can pay attention to their child. Okay, so let's practice this, as we just said, this role play, when kids are starting to be disruptive. 
so that you as a therapist have the opportunity to practice those attending skills and non-attending skills. So we just had some misbehavior on the part of kids and some minor misbehavior. So this is sometimes even attending and ignoring is tough for us as therapists if it's not a skill that we've done before. And walking around I saw some really great attending and really great ignoring. And I think I probably saw some times where people really thought they were ignoring but probably weren't ignoring. So kids, and this is not a criticism, this is what you should expect your parents to struggle with as well. It's a new skill, it's gonna take practice and, and successive approximation to get there. So kids, I want you to give feedback to your parent on what they did well. So did they attend well? Did they ignore well? Were there times also as a child that you felt that you were getting attention when maybe you should have been ignored or you felt like the parent might have been ignoring you but you were still getting attention? That would be valuable feedback or the type of interaction that your parent was having. So again, this is the type of feedback that you'll be giving to parents. So it's the type of feedback we're gonna receive as therapists to reflect upon what this experience might be like for our parents and how to better coach them. So give feedback, then we're gonna come back together as a larger group, okay? So parents, you receive feedback about your attending and also uh, stopping attending or ignoring during this interaction. And kids, you were able to give that feedback. I'd like to hear first from kids about what you felt were um, effective strategies the parents used. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think it was uh, the playfulness <laughs> while the behavior was uh, appropriate. Okay. And um, then the disengagement uh, was sudden. Mm -hmm. And it was very what that key moment was. Okay. What my how my behavior was changing in that period. So uh, it was intriguing mm -hmm. to see that I could, by a few things I did, create that uh, change in my parent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that mystery wanted me to actually help the mm -hmm. But it was also scary mm -hmm. to think that I could have that much impact so quickly. I wasn't sure. Okay. Okay. So it's sounding like there was a pretty dramatic change between the attending and not paying attention to those skills. And so particularly for a young child, that contrast might help to paint that picture readily, but it sounds like you want to make sure it's done in a very supportive way and that we should be mindful of encouraging parents that it, we're, we're not being punitive right now, we're just withdrawing attention when, when misbehavior happens. What are other reactions from kids? Yes? You know, I was amazed that she contained herself and didn't react. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't an extreme reaction. It wasn't in anything. It was just a withdrawal of attention. Mm -hmm. But that took a bit considering what I was doing that was bad. Okay, so she handled that strategy. Really <laughs> <bad>. <laughs> so that mild disruptive behavior, you really decided to, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We were talking about it. She mm -hmm. had turned away, but then the louder my my little bang boom got. It's just like a normal human reaction. She sure. Turned at one point, and we were just talking about that how natural it is when you hear a sound and, mm -hmm. turn and how hard it would be and how much practice yep. it would take for a parent to really not turn. Sure. When you're so used to turning. Yeah. So, um, but then what, what I did, I did when she did totally turn her body away. I did stop, and mm -hmm. then she actually got closer, and then I resumed my drawing. And, mm -hmm. and then the, the, the interactions began in a positive way. Okay. So I, I just thought that was a really good thing. And we were just observing that it's so natural to turn. Sure. And in a supermarket or whatever, <laughs> you know, you're tired, you're doing grocery shopping, the kid mm -hmm. wants some candy, you're not going to get the candy, and it's a full blown tantrum. And then it's just natural for the whole store that you look at yep. where the action is. <laughs> sure. Right? So, you know, and that is a real challenge for parents. Yep. And, you know, and, and just normal human reactions. Sure. And you know, I think you bring up a really great point is that sometimes it's our natural inclination to misbehaviors happening to go to it, and particularly for parents who have a very strong pattern of my kids are messing up all the time and I have to like manage them and control them all the time. This, even though in some ways it's very subtle and it seems easy for us to explain, I think what you're eloquently stating is that it's going to be hard for some parents to implement it and it might take a lot of practice in session with you as a supportive therapist teaching your parents how to attend to an activity and then how to um, 
ignore the misbehavior that's happening and re-engage in a way that's meaningful, but also supportive of of what the overarching mission is, which is start to de redevelop that relationship. So I think the more we can experience it too as therapists and appreciate that it's not something that you just say once and instantly do, but take some practice, it'll help us to be mindful of how that's hard for our parents to change and the support that they might need. So parents, so we've heard now from kids upon their response to their parents' kind of handling of the situation, parents. What are some things that you found useful strategies for you to engage and then also to withdraw from the child? So things that you might find helpful to share with other therapists or with parents. Yes? I'm very concrete so that when my child at first responded appropriately to my interest, I stayed interested, involved, mm -hmm. and focused in on what she was doing. And then what happened was that she became frustrated over building Lincoln Logs mm -hmm. and her, let's say, I must be right, her mm -hmm. perfectionism got in the way and she and, and became upset and, and I disengaged and she sort of went like Escalated. this. Escalated. I explained to her that daddy won't, you know, in some fashion mm -hmm. be involved if you're going to act that way. And then she said, let's fix it. Mm -hmm. When she said, let's fix it, I focused in on that being a very positive thing. Mm -hmm. I said, that's you know, very good. Daddy will help you. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that she was trying to get my attention. I thought that what she was doing mm -hmm. was being personally frustrated over sure. her building. And when I disengaged, I thought that when she said, let's fix it, I thought she was wanting my involvement mm -hmm. and feeling that that's where it came from. OK. And so I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that you know, you were able to look for, you know, you didn't expect positive, perfect behavior out of the child again to give them your attention. You wanted to look for progress or for successive approximation towards good behavior in the child and then your attention helped that along. So that might be something to reflect upon with parents as well and helping to coach them. Like I like that, you know, they didn't get perfect right away but you went with them you helped them as they started to change their behavior by giving them your attention yes for, uh, for me right from the outset um, self-awareness was important just being in tune with mm -hmm. what i'm feeling and what i'm thinking so not knowing where my fictitious son willie mm -hmm. this picture um i was very aware to be um to to, to be attentive but not inundating the child mm -hmm. with the uh, questions, mm -hmm. uh, just being observant but not intrusive. Mm -hmm. so that's where the awareness uh, was important. Now, as the picture started to happen, um, I found myself needing to maintain a positive stance, not knowing where my really is going to take that mm -hmm. So I start. So I found myself naturally deconstructing the picture in my own mind early in mm -hmm. the process. So saying like, oh, that's a semicircle. Well, those are interesting, you know, mm -hmm. sort of interesting lines. So just staying around the details around the lines. Mm -hmm. When I started getting a bigger sense, let's say a bigger picture, mm -hmm. um, naturally uh, it would have been very easy to be heavy handed in this situation, mm -hmm. and overreact, and not be appropriate yeah. um, in reprimand. What I did is I stayed calm, mm -hmm. not being judgmental. And so let me ask you, as therapists going through this for the first time, was it a skill that you mastered right away? You see some heads yes, some heads no. Do you anticipate that this is something that your parents are going to master right away? No. Okay. How many tries do you think you might have to go through with parents or how many, how many uh, role plays do you think you might have to go through with parents? Mm -hmm. Because attending to some older children may be punishment for them. They may be <laughs> Fair <them>. point. <laughs> and in, in that respect, act out so that you will leave. Yeah. Disengage. Yeah. That's the intention of child. Mm -hmm. to sure. Often parents and smaller children feel like they're attending because I've invited you into my room to watch TV, but that's your environment, your yes, space. Nice. You're watching with your TV. That's punishment for me. Mm -hmm. Actually, what you should be doing is coming into my space. Yep. My Mm -hmm. And engaging in what I'm doing. Yep. And sometimes do it the opposite. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Now you're inviting me into your room, and now you're telling me to be quiet, and you're not really talking to me. You just want me present with you, yep. which is not the intent, which is right. not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so in, in doing so, when you have a five-year-old that's playing with these mm -hmm. people and trying to engage with you when you're, you're shutting and you know, quiet, yep. attending is more than just being present. Mm -hmm. it, it really is about connecting. Mm -hmm. And often that gets confused. I, yep. um, you know, I, I think for a parent to turn away, like in this mm -hmm. situation where the parent turned, a five-year-old might come around to your face mm -hmm. and you're turning again, and now, now yep. it's a game. Yep. So for me, I'm playing. You're feeling like you're disengaging with yep. me. But now we're playing people, and I don't even, you know, yep. we're, we're on different pages. Yep. And probably why having kids present in session to practice these skills is so valuable and contributes to such a large effect in change in behavioral parent training programs because we as therapists can help to look at that situation objectively and help to coach parents into, you know, when are we engaging and are we really doing a good job of attending to our kids in the way that's in, that we're intending, not just come sit next to me and we're not going to speak, but, you know, coaching them through those skills. And I think the, the other thing that you kind of are implicitly bringing up is that for parents, they may think they're making overtures to that, and they are, but we may need to coach them along the way just like we're coaching the kids. And so my, my larger purpose here is to remind you that just as kids are gonna make success, successive approximations towards the desired behavior, so are parents. And we're gonna have to support the small changes they're making and continue to work with them until we get them to a place where this strategy is going to be meaningful with their child and to also set their expectations for how fast do we expect kids to change, what are versions of success, what success of approximation. I thought you did just such a beautiful job of highlighting some of the things that could go awry and to, as therapists, help us be prepared for working with parents. So thank you for your comment. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she really felt like she was being attending to the child, mm -hmm. with the, but the entire time bashed the artist. What are they doing? Da, da, da. And this was something that the child really appreciated with the artist. So you can't just bash da da, da mm -hmm. your generation. Yep. And so the child would not enjoy that exchange. Yep. Why am I watching this because they're going to bash everything mm -hmm. that comes on that I care about? Mm -hmm. I'd rather leave. This yep. is not working. Yep. Hang out with someone else. And particularly for older kids, being mindful of what the developmental considerations are in terms of spending quality time with an older child um, are going to look very different than they are with a younger child. And again, probably emphasizing the value in practicing and planning with parents. Not only this is the skill, making sure they understand it, but strategically, how are you going to do it at home? And now let's practice it so we can see how it's going. And now let's go home and try it, but really setting parents up for success just like we're trying to set our kids up for success. Yes? I like your repeating and that the goal of this is to improve, your, improve a positive relationship. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to forget mm -hmm. that. And I think that might be a big thing to do with parents. Mm -hmm. What you're there for mm -hmm. and what you're trying to do. Make it nice for people, nice for people, enjoy being with each other. Mm -hmm. Find words and somehow say that. Sure, yeah. I just thought, and I think you brought this up already, but I wanted to um, mention sabotage. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of um, family members, and then the parent that you're working with might do really well, but then the grandparent might sabotage mm -hmm. the business that you And um, where I work, I see that a lot. Yeah. It happens a lot. And you have to go. You have to point out your reinforcing that behavior. Grandma's reinforcing that behavior. You're doing a really good job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes, like you said, acknowledging that there's a, a legitimate barrier, um, that it might not be grandma's intent to sabotage, but they are, or it, maybe it is her intent. Well, a lot of we, times people don't even know yeah. that that's what they're doing. I mean, they're looking at their grandchild and smiling, and mm -hmm. they might be looking at the situation and, mm -hmm. and thinking, oh, my daughter's doing so much better with her child, but the child's looking at grandma and grandma's smiling, yeah. and that's and I think acknowledging to the parent what is a barrier and what's not and, 
and normalizing that and helping to prepare them for, okay, if you run into that barrier, whatever it may be, let's come up with some contingency plans and emphasizing the importance of trying it at home and practicing it and working to get around any of those hurdles that might be in the way. The homework for this session is quite simple. It's to go home and to do special play time or special time or special hangout time, whatever you denote it with the parent, at least five times that week. And as it says in the manual, we want to do it a minimum of 15 minutes. Um, you can negotiate that time with parents to get it to fit into their day. But what the intent is it's that they go home and try it for a meaningful period of time over and over again. And part of doing that, well, actually, let me ask you, what is the intent of having parents go home and try it repeatedly with their child? So, it's so, natural. so it starts to become more natural. What else is the intent? So they can see the effects. Yep. So it starts to feel more predictable between the parent and the child. And so it can start to feel more predictable between the parent and the child. So when we, you know, we have mentioned that in each session, we're going to assess homework or open with homework and say, how did the homework go? What went successfully? What can we problem solve? And part of the reason why we open with homework is to, in some respects, try to reinforce to the parent the value and the importance of doing homework, of trying this at home, but then also to support them in the changes that they might be making and to strategically guide them in continuing to try it so that they can realistically evaluate, is this a strategy that's going to work with my family and my household? Is this a, a realistic way to start to rebuild that relationship? I'm going to pause for just a moment before moving on to session three. Um, any questions that you have about session two and, and the intent behind attending? Yes? Um, in the agency I work with, we often are working with very young children. And um, sometimes the power of the moment in a five minute period um, comes out in terms of this attending piece. Often we'll use bigger tapes. Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, the parent who believes that they're attending often isn't conscious of their own behavior mm -hmm. and might do some eye rolling or check their watch mm -hmm. while they're in that little five minute period and will sometimes notice a contingency where the child's behavior escalates mm -hmm. at a point where it's something so subtle as that the parent may not even be aware of. Okay. And um, that's one of the things that uh, is hard to get across to parents. Mm -hmm. um, during this session. Yep. During something like this where we're talking about attending and say I do it all the time, but my child yep. it doesn't make any difference. You know. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes hard to let them know you're not really doing it. Or, yep. or there's something about the way you're doing it That's that is also can it's a mixed message perhaps. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if this is a time that you would typically bring in something like that, uh, have somebody observe you yep. or see if let, let me recap for a second to make sure everyone can hear and then to get their reaction. So um, you work with very young kids and sometimes even in short durations of attending you'll see parents do things like look at their watch or roll their eyes or things that uh, in a nonverbal way are demonstrating to the child that they're not really into the moment or paying attention to the moment and it's not that a parent's doing that maliciously or even intentionally may not be realizing some of those behaviors that they're doing that send the message that I'm not really into this right now. Um, and so one strategy that you've used is to sometimes videotape a parent and then have that parent watch the videotape back. And you're asking, do people have other ideas about other strategies? What do we think about that strategy? And are there other possible ways that we can, can coach parents? Because most parents don't want to be videotaped. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. So let me open this up to the larger group for ideas. I, I know I personally have some, some thoughts, but what might be strategies that you could use with parents if you see parents doing some very subtle or minor behaviors that might be demonstrating a lack of uh, paying, attention to, pa paying attention or showing interest in the activity? Even before I start the session, I would tell the parent that mm -hmm. I will be observing to see if, it's, if it works well and point out why it worked and why it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And then I would, you know, I point out to them that did you, were you aware that you watched okay. it time, two times? Were you aware that you rolled your eyes? And then I point okay. out that that might so work. 
maybe supportively pointing out some of those things that parents are doing that they may not know. And if a parent's resistant to being filmed and to watching their own film, to, to be that objective, supportive, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm your support. You will be yep. pointing out, observing and pointing out okay. you know, what works and what doesn't work. As a prevention piece, when you're introducing it, to bring it out, that these are some number of ways in which you send messages mm -hmm. to kids or just in general communicate mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. and bring it out that way so that they can be conscious or aware of it. And then when you, you know, I guess discuss it, you say, you know, can anybody observe or just be aware of, you know, I know mm -hmm. in general that there were behaviors that yep. we talked about before that were exhibited. So either using it in a preventative strategy. So here are some things I have noticed about other parents. I'm not saying you're going to do that, but things in my experience I've seen that have conveyed to kids that I'm not really interested in what you're doing, or to say afterwards, you know, I saw you do X, Y, and Z so beautifully. One thing I don't know if you're aware of is I saw you checking your watch repeatedly, and it might be because I set you up that I wanted you to play for five minutes, but I, I'm concerned that might have been communicating to the child you weren't really interested. You know, was that intentional? Just kind of bringing it up in a safe way. Yep. And another thing you can do after that is um, say to the parent, okay, when we go back in the room, let's try it again. And let's come up with a signal so that I can go sneeze or I can do whatever. Because the parent may then say, to you, I'm so not aware of it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I say, so I can help you to see that. How about if we come up with a signal together so if I see it, I can just move from this side of the room to that side of the room. Or I can mm -hmm. sneeze and say, excuse me. And then we can talk about, if you don't get it, we'll talk about later what I saw. Mm -hmm. What I want you to do is to see how the behavior has changed and acknowledge that it happened right at that time. Mm -hmm. And then parents feel like you're in with them, you're on their team, mm -hmm. because you're doing something together. Yep. And they'll see that it's really helpful. What? They don't feel so threatened. I think that's a really fantastic strategy. What I was going to share is what Sheila Eiberg does in parent-child interaction therapy is they ahead of time let parents know that they are going to be observed and that they're going to be coaching them and they watch parents through a two-way mirror. So a parent and a child is interacting in a room practicing those child-directed uh, skills. So parents saying, oh, you're stacking a block on top of another one, but the parent has a, a bug in the ear or a microphone in the ear and the coach on the other side is saying, wow, you did a really great job of labeling what the child's doing, or you're showing great interest, you're showing enthusiasm. You're starting to ask questions to your child. Try not to ask questions. Great recovery. You're giving a lot of commands to your child. Let's let your child lead the play, and you're going to follow what they do. And so they do some online or live coaching. If you have the resources to do it, I have seen that work swiftly and effectively and beautifully. I think a natural barrier for some of us is we don't have the resources to do it, but you guys have come up with some really beautiful alternatives to get that same intention across and to coach parents. So I, I think those are really fantastic. I think also just educating on body language and mm -hmm. on the cues and like facial reactions, you know, even prior to like the actual role play, mm -hmm. like, you know, and how it's perceived by, you know, maybe mm -hmm. by the child. You know, looking at your watch, well, you might just think, you know, because I look at my watch a million times. Yep. You know, I just, I, I know my own behaviors, but, mm -hmm. you know, when your child sees that they might, they may think you're not really interested in what they're doing, you know, just yep. kind of saying in a general way, mm -hmm. or just educating the parent on just a general body behavior. Yep. And I, I'm laughing because um, that commercial with the, the phone, where, like, the, the guy's peeing and, the, you know, the guy's texting and he drops it, and, like, the, the wife is, you know, negligee and the person's like this and the kid's playing ball and throws the ball at the guy's head but I, I mean I just think that goes with attending I mean and, and we're all in this communication text 24 hours a day and I think just I think it's so important that even if it's five minutes ten minutes fifteen mm -hmm. minutes the parent can put away the walk you know if it's a constant mm -hmm. watch, you're watching your purse um, if you you know you're on, on texting turn off your phone you know mm -hmm. if it's going to be an attending or a parent child yep. time you really need to disconnect all the communication and all the yep. outside and really focus on the child. And you've really highlighted for us some of the important pragmatic issues that parents might not be aware of, like turn your phone off or no texting or take the watch off and, and seeing the value in engaging with, chi with your child and, and showing attention to them. The next session that we have builds upon attending. 
but starts to introduce the more strategic attention or strategic praise as another type of verbal reinforcement. So I'm, I'm going to move forward operating under the presumption that we've worked with parents on attending and that they've reached a reasonable level of being able to use that with your child, maybe not master it perfectly, but they've started to practice in a repeated way. What session three um, builds upon is continuing that attending, but starting to add in specific rewarding and ignoring <laughs> and catching our kids being good aka using labeled praise. And I feel like many of us as therapists are probably very familiar with labeled praise. So let me just clarify that. Labeled praise is what? Good job. Labeling the behavior you want to see. Labeling the behavior you want to see. So not, in some ways, general rewarding can be like, great job or good one. And labeled praise being, hey, great job. I like the way that you kept working on your homework. Or, man, I really am impressed with how you're building that, that clock tower so high, or you're doing such a great job playing quietly. I really appreciate that. So it's showing attention, but showing it strategically for the behavior that the parent wants to see increase. So this is one we'll come back to, those behaviors that parents identified that were defined and observable that they wanted to see decrease over time but then also behaviors that they wanted to see increase over time or replacement positive behaviors. Parents at this point may have come up with some new positive or replacement behaviors, but that, what they identified two sessions ago, could be a good place to start to kind of prompt them on what to praise. So during our special time or special hangout time or special play time, parents will continue to use attending but will strategically and specifically look for those behaviors that they want to see increase and essentially try to catch their child being good. So when they see their child doing that behavior, they want to catch it, make notice of it, and label it. So what might be an example that a parent would identify as a positive behavior they want to see more of in their kids or would be a replacement behavior? Completing homework. What else might be an example? Thank you for doing it the first time I asked. Okay, so compliance, so following directions more readily. Look at me while I talk to you. So making eye contact and paying attention while talking. So we're going to take one of those behaviors. Um, I'm going to do the eye contact because I think it, it, as an example, will fit in nicely with attending. So if one of the things that the parent has said, I want to see decrease, is my child not following directions that replacement or positive behavior conceptually could be something like paying attention to me or looking at me when I'm talking to them. So weaving this into the context of special playtime, once parents have gained mastery over just showing interest in their child, we want them to continue to show interest, but then try to use some strategic praise to increase those behaviors they want to see. So if we're playing with the child, we'll use an example of blocks, I might say, Oh, you're really, you know, you're stacking your blocks on top of each other. You just put that blue one on top of the yellow one. Oh, you put a second blue one on top of the yellow one. Hey, I really like your eye contact. Oh, okay, so you put another one on top of the yellow one. You're building a really tall tower. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, look, it's getting higher and higher. I really like when you look at me when we're talking. That's nice for me. Okay, so you put another block on there. Oh, I see. So what we're going to coach parents into or give them directions is to pick a strategic behavior. And again, I know this is just a, a general example. But to pick a behavior that they want to catch their kids being good and start to practice that during the context of special time. So if it's paying attention or following directions, to start to weave in some natural directions and then seeing if kids follow them and strategically praising it. So the strategies that you're going to work on with parents are A, identifying what are those behaviors that they want to see increase and when is that happening. Teaching parents what is labeled praise. It's, it, you can throw in general like nice one, good one, that's not harmful to kids, but strategic labeled praise is good one, I like that you made eye contact with me, if that's the behavior. Or, I really like seeing your eyes when I'm talking. Or, you're doing such a good job paying attention to me. That makes me feel really important. Or, you know, other praise statements, specifically labeling the behavior that they want to see increase and providing opportunity 
to praise their child and to state that labeled praise to their child. So again, this might be a time when parents are getting better about paying attention to their child or showing interest in what they're doing to have kids come into session to practice that labeled praise and to look for opportunities for parents to say, that's the behavior you want to see increase, this would be a good time to praise it. Or hey, you caught that one and you made notice of it to your child. That was a really great strategy, really great labeled praise. And the overall intent here is to continue that positive relationship with the child, start to integrate more systematically, ignoring the behaviors that we don't want to see continue and providing specific labeled praise for the behaviors that we do want to see continue. Does that make sense at a conceptual level what the intent of session three is? Okay. Okay, so the overall goals of the session are, as we said, to continue that positive interaction, to pay attention, to follow up on the skills taught in the previous session, and start to encourage specific verbal rewarding as a means of behavior change and to also increase the knowledge of methods to reduce problematic behavior. So though we may have instructed parents last session to divert their eye contact or to slightly turn away or to get up and leave the situation when problematic behavior arose, we're gonna start labeling it now as intentional ignoring. And we're gonna expand on this and label later sessions. But we want to start more strategically identifying for families what the behavior is that they're using and what the intended purpose is. So again, we're gonna bring back that ABC chart, whether you're labeling it antecedent behavior or consequence or something else. I'm gonna bring it back and identify for parents, just as we did the week prior, that one consequence following a behavior is attention. We're trying to increase attention, increase our relatedness to our child during positive play. Another consequence is a social reward or also called labeled praise. So specifically catching your child when they're doing the thing that you want to see increase and providing labeled attention to it. So making sure parents understand that in a conceptual way, how that's different than attending and that it is in fact a strategic consequence that we're using. Again, they might be practicing ignoring and we might start to bring that to light, but that's not the intent overtly of this session. It's to continue to build that positive relationship and label the positive behaviors we want to see increase. Um, so when we're role playing with parents, the role play is going to be largely similar to what we did last session, which is teaching parents how to show interest into their kids. We're going to first role play, show interest with their kids. We're gonna first role play in session with the parent and the therapist. And the therapist is gonna provide some natural opportunities for parents to use um, different types of social rewards, like labeled praise or verbally noting what it is that their child's doing and to give them strategic opportunity to use that. So, because I love role plays apparently, we're gonna do one less role play to, to end out our session today. So again, we're gonna stay in the same partners. We're gonna have one parent, one child, Ahead of time, parent, I want you to tell your child what is one hypothetical behavior that as a parent you're looking to see in your child to catch your child being good. And children, again, because this is a, a hypothetical role play, I want you to strategically do that behavior at some opportunities to give your parent the chance to catch it and to label it and to notice it. And then we're gonna switch and flip the role play come back and talk about how we might integrate this strategy with parents, okay? So are we clear on who's gonna be parents and who's gonna be kids? Give you a quick second. Are we clear on the task? I want you to switch now. Thank you. I would like you to switch so whomever was child before, the parent was uh, attending and doing labeled praise, and I would like you to switch and the other person be the child the parent be doing a ten, uh, labeled praise. But child, fill in your parent on what you're doing. We're gonna take another quick minute to role play this and then come back together as a larger group to deconstruct it. All right, so what we just practiced and what you would practice with your parents, again, is continuing attending and then starting to integrate strategic labeled praise or verbal praise for catching your child being good. 
The other content pieces of the third session are not only integrating specific labeled praise for catching your child being good, but how to also integrate physical rewards. Physical rewards being things like a high five, a hug, a wink, a thumbs up. So teaching parents kind of a broader repertoire of ways to strategically identify and reinforce the behaviors that they want to continue to see increase in the future. Also embedded in session three, it's in some ways, again, easier material to master, but also a lot of material, is strategically planned ignoring, which is what we integrated last session integrated this session, but starting to label it for parents and working specifically with parents on what's ignoring and what's not, which were a lot of the ideas that you all identified about when is it ignoring, what does ignoring look like, and practicing ignoring with parents. My sense from the room is that people are feeling comfortable with understanding ignoring physical reward and verbal reward. Is that the case? Yep. Okay, so I don't think we're gonna belabor uh, chapter three, but I will ask if you're, you know, after reading it, to think about it critically, um, both in terms of how it fits into social learning theory and in terms of working with your parents. So for some families, integrating all three of those concepts simultaneously is something that can be done and mastered in an individual session. Others you may find that, nope, we're gonna start first and we're gonna stay on positive relationship building for a while. And first we're gonna integrate verbal rewards, and then we're gonna integrate physical rewards, and then we're gonna integrate ignoring. Or you may say, wow, this parent's really struggling with ignoring. We're gonna focus much of our session on that, and then maybe continue with session three for a while. So again, I, I want to make sure that I'm emphasizing that these content pieces are intended to be a guide for you to make judgments about how parents are mastering them, integrating them, but should be used prescriptively as you're seeing parents succeed or struggle with certain concepts that you provide more opportunity for them to understand them and understand how to integrate them into their home and their relationship with their child. So those are the major topics um, that you will cover up to chapter three. So what we went over today was social learning theory, identifying what's reinforcement, what's punishment, going through antecedents, behaviors, and consequences, the different types of consequences being reinforcement and punishment. We then talked about behavioral parent training generally, went through several commercially available or publicly available programs to look at the commonalities among those. We then went into the meta-analysis that showed us what seemed to be the more potent change agents in behavioral parent training. And now we're going through session checklists and session content that you should use as a guide, but also within the larger framework of social learning theory and how to apply this with your parents. And we went through the first session, which was an overview of social learning theory, the second session, which was starting to teach parents how to attend or pay attention to or show involvement in their child's life, and then how to specifically start to intentionally integrate some consequences, those consequences being planned ignoring, labeled praise, or social verbal reward, and then social physical reward to start to shape their children's behavior. Okay, so that's what we covered today. And tomorrow what we'll do is we'll continue with these sessions, moving into more punishment-based strategies and then more complex behaviors. And also trying to do a job of keeping in mind when it's better to keep it simple and when it's better to go to a more in-depth program and how, you know, what your decision-making criteria is there. Um, before closing out for the day though, I wanted to check in and see if everyone's comfortable with the material that we've gone through so far, if there are any questions, and if there's anything strategically that you want me to, to think about tonight to pay special attention to tomorrow. So just general reactions. Yes? It's just the, um, I work with the juvenile 12, 17, so mm -hmm. I figure out of for the middle ones. So yep. Just, I know they mentioned the texting and the what bonding or the problem. Yes. So a little bit more on that. I appreciate that feedback, and we should do a better job of integrating how to use these strategies with adolescents. Um, so thank you for prompting me on that, and we'll, we'll work to do that tomorrow. And if, and if we, that starts to lag, I hope you'll prompt me during our session tomorrow so that we're, we're sure to leave you all with some tools and some skills for working with adolescents. Yes? I've got more of a logistical question. Sure. Are you back in our same groups tomorrow, or are you going to see That's up to you entirely. Um, 
you know, I wanted to put you into somewhat meaningfully clustered groups for the role plays today, but it's up to you. If you want to stay with your same groups, cool. And if you want to learn some new faces and some new names and potentially get some new strategies, that's equally as fine. We'll kind of stay in some way, same format tomorrow with introducing concept, practicing, assessing application with our parents. I understand, yes. Anything else that we should make mention of before we close for today? Yes. I wanted to know, um, if you're working individually with a parent on this, are mm -hmm. you in role play with the parent as a, as a teaching method? Yep. Typically? So the question is, when working individually with parents, we're doing role play right now. Do we integrate role play into our sessions with parents? Yes. As a therapeutic technique and as an assessment technique, we want to see how readily our parents are mastering the skills taught to them. And then it also gives them the chance to practice it before doing it with their children. So, you back yeah. So instead of if you're doing group, oftentimes the role play is parent to parent. When doing individual session, oftentimes the role play is parent therapist changing out roles. So you're both modeling and assessing how the parent's doing.